Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to Faith Love Fellowship Church. We are delighted and honored to, that you would tune in and, and uh, watch. And I invite you to get your Bible, get your notepad. We are going to study Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, as I've said many times before, on Sundays we do topics. We believe the Spirit of God wants us to cover, you know, we are a full gospel church, and so the, we, our responsibility is to feed the sheep and to feed them a, a well-balanced meal. And um, when I say well-balanced, we need to cover a lot of subjects. We need to cover righteousness. We need to cover peace. We need to cover um, uh, walking in the Spirit, uh, knowing who we are in Christ, the authority of the believer. There are so many righteousness. There are so many topics that we, we need to teach people and train them to understand so they can walk in the light of it. Uh, and, and that's our Sundays. And many times we do um, more than one. Sometimes it turns into series because uh, sometimes you just can't get it all done in one, on one Sunday. So, uh, and it's been great. It's been fun. Uh, people are being built up and, and, uh, and being equipped to do the work of the ministry. Hallelujah. But on Wednesday nights, we, uh, in prayer, felt that we uh, wanted to do more of a line upon line uh, type of a Bible study. So we uh, began a number of years ago and just week after week, we just keep on going. When we get to the end, we start the beginning again. And uh, so we are up to Hebrews chapter 2, and uh, we invite you to, um, to join us. Again, I always encourage you that uh, take your Bible with you. I read from the King James. You are welcome to read from whatever Bible you are comfortable with. And, uh, and I do encourage you to take notes because uh, you cannot trust your memory to be able to hold on to all the things the Spirit of God is going to show you and say to you uh, in times in, of ministry in the Word of God. So you need to write them down, uh, then go back over them and process them and, and think about them. And the Bible talks about meditate, mutter uh, over and over again. And uh, you, you want to get all the nutrition out of the Word of God that you can. And uh, so uh, to do that, you have to give it your attention and, and really allow it to, to, uh, to settle into your heart. Uh, so, uh, let's pray together and let's begin. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for this and every opportunity that we have to come into your presence to be together with you. We believe that it does us uh, tremendous good. Uh, we thank you that it is feeding us, that it's establishing us, that we are growing, that we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds to the image of our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that it's giving us ammunition against the lies and the deceptions of darkness. And uh, we bless you and praise you for the good things that we receive tonight. And uh, we promise, as always, not to be just hearers, but doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, hallelujah. The epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 2. Amen. If uh, you ever want to catch up, by the way, um, we do um, post, stream our services, as you know, on, on Facebook. But everything is backed up on Facebook, but also on YouTube. So simple Faith with Love Fellowship on YouTube, and you can watch all previous services, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Friday night youth group. They've all been exceptional, uh, and uh, they're there for you to be a blessing. All right? So chapter 2, he, he begins, therefore, okay? Um, therefore, uh, my teachers used to say, you got to find out what it's there for. It's based on what we talked about in the first chapter. In, in the first chapter, it started off that God, uh, you know, in times past spoke to us by the prophets, but now he speaks to us by his son. Amen. And he's appointed him heir of all things. And, uh, and he's, as I said in verse three, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down. And we wanted to focus on, but what does he uphold all things? By the word of his power. So Jesus and the word of God cannot be separated. It's the word of God. It's the Lord Jesus. Amen. One and the same. And it, desire, it deserves our attention. It deserves our, our respect. Um, and he tells us that we are to hide his word in our hearts. Uh, and, and that we are to be, again, not just hearers, but doers of it. Observe to do is when you'll have good success, he told Joshua. And, uh, and so here, um, because of these things, we move on to chapter 2. He says, therefore, because of this truth, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. 
Now, I could repeat that for two hours. It's that important. Amen? It is that important. It, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken, how? Spoken, the word of God, by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Heard what? Heard words. Jesus taught. The Bible says he went about doing good, healing all those oppressed of the devil. That doing good predominantly preaching, teaching, and healing. Amen? Uh, and, and that's part of, of, of his every single day. He went about preaching, teaching, and healing. Preaching to those who'd never heard before in the, in the mountaintops by the seashore. And, uh, and, and, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, amen? And then in the temples he would teach, he would expound upon the scriptures. Many of the people that attended the temple were learned, but they were, they were believing, their believing was, was not right. They, in some cases they were believing the wrong things and they were teaching the wrong things and, and it, was getting, it was getting out of control, it was getting out of hand. And so Jesus had to bring them back to, to foundation, had to, had to engulf them and breathe, bring them back. Amen. And, uh, so we're so grateful for, uh, for that. Amen. So, um, let's see, it goes on. It says, God, verse four, uh, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So God also bearing them, and what is the them? The word of God, the words spoken by Jesus. Are you listening? Amen. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Now, the word of God says that the Lord accompanies his word or he, 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 he uh, backs it up, amen, with signs, wonders, and miracles. So he confirms his word. And, and here is a, yet another way of saying it, God also bearing them witness that they were, that the word of God was being preached. And when the word of God is being preached, their signs, wonders, and miracles will follow. Hallelujah. God will confirm it. In other words, God will say, yes, that is my word accurately spoken. And signs, wonders, and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit will operate. Hallelujah. We have God's, God's um, word on it. Amen. It says here, according to his own will. It's God's will. That signs and wonders and miracles and the gifts of the Spirit are, would be an operation Hallelujah, in the earth. Uh, why? Because that's God's will. He, he, and the way predominantly that they operate is wherever the word of God is preached. So if it's preached in a church setting, then we can expect these things in a church setting. But if it's preached out in the highways and the byways and the seashore and the mountains, we can expect that as well. Are you listening? Um, uh, there are signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation all over the world. And, and in some cases, they operate because some folks have, they have, there's no alternative. There is no, there is no plan B. They, they, if they don't have a move of God, they will die. They will starve. They will perish. And so there's a sense of desperation. There's a sense of, of urgency. There's a sense of expectation. And so when a minister gets up and tells them that God loves them and he wants to provide for them and that Jesus has provided healing, they run. They, they embrace it with all of their hearts. They believe it. And then you see signs, wonders, and miracles and, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation. And, and some people say, well, why don't we see more of that here? Well, one of the reasons is because we have so many plan B, plan C, plan D, so many alternatives. You know, we have so many other ideas. Yeah, I quite don't, don't see it that way. You know, we're not hungry enough, I guess. We're not desperate enough. 
As long as there's a plan B, as long as there's a medicine cabinet that has medicine in it, then why do we have to believe God? But there are folks around the world that there are no, there is no medicine, there is no help, there is no hope. There are no doctors. They can't get to anybody. They know that unless God does something for them, they will do it out. And so they come hungry. They come expecting and signs and wonders and miracles. God loves when his people come hungry. Amen. He says that if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. Hallelujah. So uh, it's very, very important that we, we realize, remember he said, therefore, in verse chapter 2, verse 1, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. That's the danger of the church, that we let the things of God slip. And the word of God is no longer priority number one in our lives. And obeying God and pleasing God and these things just fall. Uh, from, from a place of priority to a place of convenience and then unfortunately in some cases non-existent. And, and God is uh, letting us know, you know, in verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? There is no other Savior. There will be no other life preserver. There will be no other lifeboat. If we, if we deny this lifeboat, there is no other. Are you listening? Someone asked a young man a question once. I thought it was wonderful. They said, why does a good God send people to hell? And his answer was very wonderful. He says, no, we were already headed to hell. All of us were. But God sent a lifeboat. And if you neglect the lifeboat, then it's no one's fault but yours if you don't get saved. Are you listening? God has provided his son, and all who believe in him will be saved. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So it's God not, is not God sending anybody to hell. All of us were going there because of our sin. But God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that all who would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Amen? And, uh, and, and I just want you to know there is no other. There are some who have a mentality that they're waiting for the Messiah. They're waiting for the Messiah. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're, 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 you're waiting for one who will never come because he's already come. And when he comes back, he will not be coming back as a sacrificed lamb. He'll be coming back as a conquering king. Amen. And uh, every knee will bow. I know we sing a song, better if we bow now rather than be forced to bow then. Are you listening, my brothers and sisters? So, so he continues on and he's, he's, he's honoring and blessing uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and, and being the word of God in the flesh, amen? The word of God made flesh and dwelling among us. He says, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? And the answer to that question is, is love. Amen? God created mankind because it, we are an expression of, of his love. Hallelujah. And, and he rescued us and continues to rescue us because of his love. And he, and he thinks of us and he does all he can to, to help us and to bless us all because of his love. Amen. We, we've been told in the word of God, God, the love of God never fails. And he bears up for us. First Corinthians 13 is, talks about love. And we, sing, we talk about it in weddings and things like that. But it's really talking about God's love. It's really talking about God's love. And it's talking about that God's love in the, in the respect that this is the way God is. This is the love that God has. But at the same time, it helps us to understand that's the love that God has shed and brought our hearts. That we can now operate in that kind of love. And it's a supernatural love. It's not based on feelings or emotions. not based on if you love me, I love you. It's based on God's love has been shed abroad in my heart. I understand what true love really is. And so now I'll not only be a carrier of it and a receiver of it, but I'll be a giver of it. Amen? Hallelujah. So take your time, read 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, 
again and realize that's the way God loves you. And that's the way God wants to love through you. Amen? Hallelujah. So uh, he goes on and he says here, I love this. It says, uh, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he hath put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not, yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Amen? So he has made... Jesus, a little lower than the angels, the one who created the angels, the one who rules and reigns, the ones who the angels who remain faithful to God adore. Are you listening? And then he, he commissioned them to minister to we who are heirs of salvation, that we, that we have been called by God. Um, they, they, have been, they have been assessed to those who are called to, to salvation, to minister to us, to, to protect and to serve and, and to aid and to comfort and, and, and to be with us. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, Jesus, when he endured the agony of 40 days in the wilderness and he ate nothing and all after it was over and he was tempted of the devil, remember the whole thing, after it was all over, angels came and comforted him. Amen. And I've seen beautiful pictures of, of him resting his head on an angel's you know, chest, uh, just resting. Hallelujah. Praise God forever. And we have angels, uh, you know, uh, but again, you know, people um, like to go in the ditches. My, my pastor used to say, stay in the middle of the road, stay out of the ditch on one side, stay out of the ditch on the other side. There, there are some people that overemphasize the ministry of angels where they want to know their names and they, they just have images of angels all over their house and, and angels and angels and angels and it's all about angels. And no, 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 it's not supposed to be about angels. It's supposed to be about Jesus. And, and yet, then the other side of the ditch is there, there's that you're all alone and, and you've been abandoned, you've been forsaken and, and there's no hope and there's no help and that's not true either, amen? God has given his angels as ministering spirits to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. Amen. To stay in the middle of the road. Hallelujah. But all praise and all glory and all honor and all thanksgiving and all worship goes to Jesus because he's the one who commissioned them. Amen. He's the one who sent them. He created them for this reason. Hallelujah. Because he knew mankind would need the help and would need the comfort, would need the encouragement. My pastor, uh, many years ago, uh, Pastor Clint Butterbach's gone home to be with the Lord. He used to say, uh, Psalm, 90, Psalm 91, I think it's Psalm 91, Psalm 23. Anyway, he says, show me goodness and mercy. Remember that one? Shall follow me all the days of my life? Amen. I'll draw in the house of the Lord forever. He used to say, my goodness and mercy. Come on, goodness. Come on, mercy. Is mindful of the fact that goodness and mercy follow you. Amen. The presence of God is with you. That God is prepared uh, uh, for your life. And, he, and, he's, and he's always with you. And, and whatever you need, he, he's provided. Amen. Hallelujah. And make sure to thank him. Make sure to praise him. Appreciate it. Hallelujah. You don't need to know their names. You, you don't need to know how big they are. Amen. All you need to know is, is God has provided all your need for you. Hallelujah. And bless him. And thank him. And love him. Amen. So he goes on, he says here in verse 8, he says, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. This is Jesus. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So experientially, factually, everything has been put under the subjection of Jesus. Right now, it seems as though not everything has been put under his subjection. There's a lot of unruliness. There's a lot of disobedience. There's a lot of, you know, these things. But that day is coming to an end because as far as God is concerned, he has put all things under Jesus' feet. Now, for more information about that, the Bible talks about 
The husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Why is God putting up with the disobedience? Why is God putting up with the unruliness? Why is God putting up with the, with the evil and with the wickedness and the witchcraft and, and the sexual immorality and the deceit? And why is God putting up with it all? Because he says, because he's waiting, the husbandman, the farmer, amen, is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. He it does not will that any perish, but all comes to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's waiting till the very last to get fruit. This is a good time of year now uh, because it helps us to understand, you know, things are starting to dry up, vines are starting to dry up. I have grapes in my backyard, concords, and, and, and tomato plants are starting to dry up, cucumbers, peppers, things like that. They're starting to dry up. The process is beginning of drying up, but we still have plants filled with peppers that are, that are still turning red. And we still have tomatoes that are, we have the yellow, we have the orange, and we have the red. We still have tomatoes coming. We have tons of the little, the little oblong ones. I forget if they're, they're pears, uh, cherries. Uh, my, my wife loves those, those sweet something or other they are. We're still getting them. The grapevine, we have, we have pulled so many beautiful Concord grapes off, but I ate a few today. There's, it's still bearing fruit. So uh, uh, you, you don't want to start pulling down the vines yet because you want to give those vines every opportunity to, to produce and to finish. I don't know about you, but a vine-ripened tomato is better than a tomato that you take off green and put on the windowsill. It's just something about stay on the vine as long as possible. And that's the way it is with God. God's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. If God were to return now, do you realize how many people would die and go to hell? And he's not willing to do that. So he's putting up with so much in the hope that, that we will do our job and preach the gospel and live godly and righteous in the world in which we live and be a blessing and love people the way God loves us, amen? And influence people for God and for his kingdom and pray without ceasing, hallelujah, speak the word of God. You understand this. That's why we're here. That's what the work of the church is all about. Amen. Uh, because the day is coming where all the vines are coming down and, and, and all. You know, we, we uh, my wife asked, we had sunflowers growing everywhere. Giant, just giant, and and just growing everywhere, and and where wherever she wherever uh, she uh, saw too many of them, she she pulled them out while they were young and transplanted them in other places, and and you know the birds love sunflowers, and she asked us just a couple of days ago, Nick and I, if we would if we would break them and put them on the trailer and then pull up all the all of them and knock all the dirt off and and discard them, and, and we did that. And we figured, well, that's the end of it. They've produced, they've done all they do. I want you to know that trailer is loaded with birds every day. Those birds are going after those seeds. As far as those birds are concerned, there won't be a seed left on those plants when they're done with it. You follow me? So they still see fruit, even though we see dead. You follow? God still see fruit, sees fruit. Even though we consider, oh, it's too far gone. The world is, you know, going to hell in a handbasket. No, no, no. God still sees fruit. God still sees for people that are going to be saved. Are you listening? Amen? And so uh, thank God that he's a, he's a good husbandman, that he's waiting. And he, what does he call it? He's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. So guard your heart. Don't, don't criticize people. Don't judge people. You know, they're, it's their fault. It's their, they, they're the ruination. They, they, they. No, God calls them the precious fruit of the earth. So begin to call them precious fruit of the earth, even those that oppose everything godly and righteous. Call them the precious fruit of the earth. Start calling them fruit for the kingdom of God and pray for them. Amen? Hallelujah, that they would come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad somebody prayed for you? Amen? Praise God forever. So, well, that's free, by the way. Amen. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, Hebrews, but it, it follows the, the train of thought that we're, we're on. All right? So notice, uh, I love this, verse 9, but we see Jesus. But we see Jesus. Praise God. That, that's where our peace comes from. That's where our joy comes from. That's our purpose, our destiny, our focus, our hope, our help. Are you listening? 
But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He had to become lower than the angels. Because if he remained almighty God, there's nothing, he could not become a sacrifice. So he had, the Bible says he humbled himself, became a man. Are you listening? Hallelujah. And, um, and then he goes on in verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Amen? That's what he calls people, brothers, sisters. We have to guard our hearts, amen? The day in which we live, it's easy to throw, throw stones. It's easy to judge, criticize, complain, you know, find fault. And Jesus wouldn't do it. And, and he lived that kind of a lifestyle. The woman that was dragged before him was caught in the act of adultery. She was caught in the act of adultery. Where was the guy? Uh, who knows? That's a good question. You know, it takes two. But she was caught in the act of adultery and she came and they threw her down at Jesus' feet. And they began to pick up stones because the law of Moses decreed that if you're caught in the act of sin, you are deserving of death. And Jesus didn't say that that wasn't true. She was deserving of death. But he wanted them to know, so are all of you. He who's never sinned cast the first stone. And when they all realized that they too were guilty, when they looked at his eyes and realized this is not a man only standing in front of us, but this is almighty God standing in front of us. And who knows what he wrote in the sand, but he could have written down their names and, and, the, and the sins that they've committed. Who knows? He may have done it one time, uh, scribbled in the sand, and as each one looked at it, they saw their name in a list of all the sins they committed. Amen? He's still the miracle worker. Amen? Now, he didn't do it to embarrass them or to humiliate them. He did it to open their eyes. And they dropped their stones. And he turned to the woman and he said, Woman, where are your accusers? And she said, There are none. And he says, Go your way, sin no more. Are you listening? Now, Jesus, as I've said this before, just so you understand, Jesus had never sinned. He was a spotless lamb of God. He said, you who've never sinned, cast the first stone. He had, and yet, but the law said that if you're caught in a sin like that, you deserve death. But notice, Jesus, though he was well within his right to pick up a stone and kill her, and no one could possibly challenge him because he'd never sinned, he wanted us to know that's not who I am. So he said, woman, where are thou accusers? She says, there are none. He says, you got that right. I have the right to accuse you, but I choose not to. That's not who I am. I give mercy rather than judgment. Amen? Because he's good. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. And that's how he feels about people on this planet. Even the most ruthless and the most used against the things of God now, God considers them brothers, sisters, precious fruit of the earth. Hallelujah. Praise God forever. So uh, don't fight God. Agree with him and call them what he calls them. So you, you're listening, my brother and sisters. He says he's not ashamed to call them brethren. He's not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. He's responding to Heavenly Father. This is Jesus' pledge, if you will, to his Father. He says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That was a purpose. There was a, there was a reason. This is the reason that through death, he might destroy him 
that hath the power of death, that is the devil. So he took on flesh and blood so that he might destroy the devil. Amen? He answers the questions because, you know, that's been one of the questions of mankind pondering all the time. You know, where does evil come from? Where does hatred and variance and where, where does sickness and disease and poverty and lack and want and fear and anger and frustration and hatred and, mur and murder and all these, other, where do they come from? And, and Jesus is identifying it is, it is a person. And it is, it is a, a, an influential person. I mean, he's not a human. He's a, he's a, a fallen angel, but he, he's a being, if you will. And it says here, uh, for as much then as the children, verse 14, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Hallelujah. So this was the plan of God. The devil had no idea. The Bible says if the devil knew that by killing Jesus, he was going to lose everything, he never would have, he never would have uh, put, killed Jesus. But it, it was the plan of God, amen, that God would send his son, that his son would take on flesh, flesh and blood, that his son would identify with fallen mankind and take the sacrifice and be the sacrifice for our sin. Men, women, and children, past, present, and future. Hallelujah. And, and by his, his obedience, even unto death, he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, when he fulfilled his call, amen, when he, when he suffered and he died and he was buried, and his body was put in the grave, but his spirit went to hell. And he stayed there for three days and three nights. And once the judgment of God was satisfied, meaning that the sins of the world, the punishment that was deserved has been paid. Jesus came out of, by the spirit of God, Jesus came bolting out, firing like a gun out of hell. And he said, as he stood before his disciples, I have the keys to hell death and the grave. So he took the keys that Satan was trusting in. The most precious thing Satan has, Jesus took from him. Then the Bible tells he made an open show of him. He triumphing over him in it. And he said, now all authority is given unto me, including the authority that Adam and Eve lost to, to, say, to Satan in the garden. I got it back by my sacrifice, by my obedience to my father and to this plan, I have gotten it back. So now here, I give you the keys. That's why we can say death, where's your sting? We don't have to fear death. We'll never experience it. We go from life to life, amen? We may close our eyes for a moment and there was an example where Jesus, you know, met a young girl and they, they and, and said, she's not dead, she's sleeping, right? And they mocked him, they laughed him to scorn. Can you imagine? And yet he walked in, Tabitha, her eyes, and she got up and they gave her something to eat. For Christians, there is no death. Death has no sting. There is no, there is no, there is no grave, so to speak. There is, there, we don't have to fear death because we're not going to hell. The Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, when we close our eyes, we're alive unto God. We go from life to life. Amen? We've been translated out, we've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness. That's one time done, over, never going back. You with me? So we don't have to be afraid of darkness. We are now, we've been translated into the kingdom of light, to the son of his love. And, and that's the kingdom we're in. So when our eyes, when our time comes, we've run our race, we've fulfilled our calling, we've lived our life, we've done it well, we've done it strong, amen? We, we just, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit, and there you go. Hallelujah. And we go from life to life. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's something to shout about. But God wants everybody. God, God wills no men perish. God, God, the Bible, he, he, he says, he takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. He, he wants them saved. It's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of his son.
Hallelujah. The only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Are you listening, my brothers and sisters? Amen? So, notice again, 14, for as much then as the children of are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, likewise, he also himself. Hallelujah. He also himself. Wow. Almighty God. Amen? The creator and sustainer, the supreme, everything. Amen? He's, he's magnificent in, in, in every single capacity. He is brilliant. He understands physics and biology and chemistry and, and, and horticulture. And, and I, he, he, he is the definitive uh, expert in, in all of these things. Amen. I, hallelujah. And, and yet he humbled himself to become a man because something was needed. And what was needed was that he might destroy, by his death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There are a lot of people who are afraid of death. I read an uh, interesting list, I saved it because I thought it was interesting, of atheists' last words. And it was profound, but it also tears your heartstrings because they are, every single one of them comes to a place where they realize the head of the satanic church and, and scientists and all these others that, that said there is no God, they were atheists, they, they professed it, they pronounced it, they, they wrote theses about it, they, they preached it, they, they shared it, they, it, was the, it was the foundation of their, their whole life. When they came to the end of their life and they, they, they were able to kind of peer over the edge of eternity, they realized, I'm not ready for this. I'm afraid. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm ashamed. I, I see what I've done and, and, I, and, I, and I realize now that there is a God and I will stand before him. And some of them is, and I'm lost. And, I, and, I, and I'm, you know, it just breaks your heart when you read about it. It really is. And so notice, uh, it's not only enough that, that, uh, that he has set us free, are you listening, but he has come to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Some folks, you gotta, don't feel sorry for them, but pray for them. This is God opening our eyes. There are some people that don't want to go to sleep because they are tormented in their dreams. I am a believer in what you eat or what you feed on, you know, is what's going to produce in your life. And so I, I do not watch horror. I do not read horror. I do not, uh, I don't get involved in anything horror uh, kind of a thing. Are you listening? Um, I, uh, not boasting, God showed my wife and I early on, we uh, never let our children watch horror or anything like that, because uh, we like them to sleep sweet at night. We've never been woken up during the night because our children are crying because they're having nightmares. Are you listening? And uh, we're not gonna feed that. We're not gonna, we're not gonna put that in. We're not gonna allow that in our, in our home, in our children's lives. So to the best of my knowledge, my children have never had nightmares. Are you listening? Praise God. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Glory to God. So uh, uh, they're all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, that's bondage when you're afraid, when you live your life afraid, afraid of death, afraid to just be afraid. That's bondage. And Jesus said that's part of destroying him who had the power of death, the devil, and to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily, telling you the truth, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Lower than the angels, he became a man because mankind needed a savior. Wherefore, notice, I love this. Wherefore, verse 17, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest 
in things pertaining to God and to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Now that word succor means to run to the aid and bring help. To run to the aid and bring help. Are you listening? So let me say it this way, for in that he himself has now run to your aid to help you that are tempted. He is able to, I said, for, I'm sorry, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is now able to run to your aid and help you when you are tempted. Amen? He's a faithful Savior. He's a, he's a faithful God. He's a wonderful Savior. Glory to God. Wherefore, in chapter 3, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. In other words, fix your attention on him, presenting his majesty, the Lord Jesus Christ. All eyes on Jesus. Take your focus off of everything else and place them where they truly belong on Jesus. There's a lot of ways you can put it. Amen? When a dignitary comes into a room, there's usually fanfare. There's usually, is it called pomp and circumstance, right? You know, they, 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 When the bride comes into the room, they, there's a specific march. They don't play that march when the mother of the bride comes or when the other people come or, or when whoever, even when the groom comes in, they don't play that. that. That bridal march, that song is reserved for the bride. When you hear da 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 everybody in the room, eyes go on one person, one person, the bride. Are you with me? And the same thing with everything else. Any dignitary, they say, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you, and they call that person, whoever it is, all eyes go on that dignitary. Well, this is what the writer of Hebrews is, is doing here. It's okay, now wait a minute. It's good to give honor to the bride. It's good to give honor to dignitaries. It's good to give honor to, pre, to, to uh, uh, presidents and to kings and to you know, royalty and, to, and, and celebrities and, and all these other things, but there is one. Amen, who is above all others. Everything is subject to him. And, and, and here it's saying, wherefore, because of this, because of what we've said, that he was willing to become a man, to humble himself, so he might destroy him who had the power of death, the devil, amen, and to release from bondage those who are afraid of death. It says, wherefore, holy brethren, um, ba -ba, ba -ba 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 -ba, right? Partakers of the heavenly calling. Shout, amen. That's, he's talking to you. He's talking to me. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Amen. Nick preached on Sunday. He did a beautiful job. He always does. But that name, Christ, is not Jesus' last name. That is his office. He is Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the anointing of God in human form. He's the power of God in human form. Are you listening? Hallelujah. And so when you say Christ, all of heaven identifies that's the promised one. That's the deliverer. That's the Messiah. That's the mediator. That's the way. That's the truth. That's the life. There is no other. He's the door. All of heaven recognizes it. Are you listening? Amen. And so it says, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now, I want to say this before because my time is getting away from me. Is this a suggestion? No. Is this an opinion? No. This is a call. This is, this is what? This is our responsibility. Amen? Consider. 
the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Which man? The apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, amen, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. He did not come to dwell in a house is made with hands. He came to dwell in the hearts of men, amen, who he created. Glory to God. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, his words, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work 40 years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today. How often? Today. How many? Every day. Amen? Exhort one another, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Did you catch two ifs, by the way? These are conditional because there's things that we need to do. We, need, we must keep our presenting Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. Focus on him. Don't focus on others. Don't be distracted. He said, Joshua, don't turn to the right hand or to the left. Amen. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Amen. Meditate on the word of God night and day. Observe to do. Don't let anything else come out of your mouth but the word of God. Praise God forever. He says, then you'll make your way prosperous. Then you have good success. Glory to God. So notice it goes on. It says here, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke. However, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom he was grieved 40 years, was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believeth not? So we see that we could not enter in because of unbelief. Amen? So there's warnings. I've always told you the word of God is, is, is honest. And, and God is going to tell you that our, there are um, blessings for obedience, but there are um, repercussions for disobedience. There is a hell to gain. There is a, he there is a heaven to gain. I'm sorry, there's a hell to shun. He says, depart from wickedness, flee youthful lust, run, run, run from these things because they will harm you, they will harm you, they will, they will uh, sidetrack you. But looking unto Jesus, keep on walking, keep on going, praying always, amen, speak to the mountains, believe God, trust God, continue on, amen, hallelujah. Father, we love you. As always, we thank you for every opportunity we have to be together in your word. We thank you for this word deposited in our hearts. It, it is found good uh, soil to grow deep 
within our, our hearts. And as it grows, it will produce life in us and through us so that others might taste and see that the Lord is good. Father, fruit born in our lives is not for our benefit, but it's for the benefit of others, that they can partake of fruit. They can partake of peace, joy, and uh, love, mercy, kindness, patience, long-suffering, goodness. Thank you for the fruit of the Spirit of God being born in us and through us, and uh, may we abound in good works for your honor and for the blessing of the people that um, you call them um, precious fruit of the earth. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters, uh, those who we may not agree with, and those who this, that, and the other thing. We just choose to lay it all down. We call them precious fruit of the earth. We call them brothers and sisters. And we pray that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they would see the hope of their calling, that they would come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the power of darkness would be broken off of their lives so that they can see for themselves that God is good and that you have provided a way of escape for them as well and that you have a plan for their life and it's an amazing plan, a wonderful plan, a plan that will bring them health and prosperity, blessing, deliverance, peace, joy, love, and eternal life. We return as always to give you thanks and praise and bless you in the name of Jesus. Father, as we leave tonight, those that are here in the church, we pray for traveling mercies as we return to our homes. May our homes be blessed, our sleep be sweet. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.